Apple might be building three U.S. manufacturing plants that will be big, big, big and beautiful. Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg are throwing rocks at each other, and we think they should just let the robots throw the rocks for them and go fund Snopes if you like the truth. All that and so much more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1817, recorded Tuesday, July 25th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you looking to hire a tech professional? With ZipRecruiter, you can post to 100 plus job boards, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we tell you what you need to know about tech today. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. How's it going, Megan? It's going good so far. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's about to get so much better. With this top story, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if we can back that up with actual. We can. Proof. Life just got better. Cause we're <laughs> gonna talk about the tech news. Notoriously secret, Apple has just been outed, maybe by the president. Trump claims that Apple CEO Tim Cook promised him he would build three U.S. manufacturing plants. Big, big, big. Said the president. No one at Apple has confirmed this. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal, Trump also said the plants would be beautiful, but he did not say where they would be located or what they would be manufacturing. Trump also said that many people will have to leave their communities in order to move to the places where the manufacturing jobs are. You can leave, the president said. It's okay. Don't worry about your house. <laughs> That's actually, I'm not making that up. That was in the Wall Street Journal article. So yeah, uh, Apple only has one manufacturing plant. Uh, it's in Ireland. Um, he might have been talking about data centers or something else. Like, you know, a lot of like the places where uh, the phones are assembled or, you know, not owned by Apple, but contracted mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. Apple. So I think, um, yeah, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see if this is true or not. I mean, on the campaign trail, uh, Trump claimed that he would institute a 45% tax on products that were imported from China, which would make, you know, I don't know, it would be very difficult to be able to, for a lot of people to be able to buy things um, in that sense. Certainly. Um, and in, in May, Apple announced a $1 billion fund to support U.S. jobs. They do have a lot of jobs here. Um, and, you know, also Tim Cook has said part of the reason the iPhones are manufactured in China is because of the skills of the workforce. Yeah, I'm wondering if this has something to do with Foxconn um, and maybe there maybe on Trump's side of things, there's a little bit of kind of like cross cross communication. Uh, sometimes that happens. I'm just saying uh, Fox, Foxconn is expected to announce uh, tomorrow. And I don't know if this is actually going to happen tomorrow, but that's the expectation. Its own uh, plans around bringing um, bring some of its operations to the U.S. And of course, Foxconn is a huge partner, uh, one of the biggest supply chain partners that Apple works with. So if Foxconn is bringing some of that operation, those operations to the U.S., Maybe there's some, you know, kind of uh, integration or maybe but possibly that's that's part of the reason that Apple is being so hush about this, because if it's Foxconn's announcement to make, if it is made tomorrow, then uh, maybe there's some some correlation between the two. Maybe. Uh, but uh, Foxconn chairman Terry Gao uh, had said they were working on a bunch of investments in the U.S. And I think that's probably what we're kind of on the tipping point of seeing uh, here in the next few days. I wish Tim Cook would tell Donald Trump what the new iPhone was going to look like and what it was going to be called, because then we would all know. Who knows? Maybe Tim Cook would go to the White House and bring the new iPhone and then accidentally leave it there. Oh, yeah. And then it could leak to the press. Mm -hmm. And he, it would be big, big, big and beautiful. <laughs> it would be. Because uh, it's, expect, it's expected to be a pretty big phone. Big, big, big. <laughs> In 2020, almost 25 years after Adobe unleashed it onto the world, Flash, you know Flash, 
will finally see its end of life as Adobe will cease any updates or distribution at that point, Adobe will continue to offer security updates for Flash as well as offer support for current browsers up until 2020, at which time you can kiss your Flash goodbye. <laughs> I'm not going to be doing any kissing of Flash. <laughs> I just want to say that right here. Did you know uh, that in, in, in uh, 2005, when uh, Adobe bought Flash from Macromedia, uh, 98% of computers w had Flash on them. 98%. Yeah. That was Fla a lot. Everybody. Fla it was a big deal. It I was. mean, at the time, it was a huge deal. It was big around video, online video. You saw a lot of online video being delivered in, in that way. Also, games. I remember there's so many Flash games. And I actually mm -hmm. think a lot of what's you know uh, continued to exist to this point still are kind of connected to education and games and stuff like that. So if you find Flash on sites, that and really bad restaurant websites mm -hmm. that uh, continue to insist that Flash is the only way to deliver their stuff, I think they've come around now. And obviously HTML5 is the more open standard that and more secure standard, mo probably most importantly. Flash just had a number, an ongoing you know list of insecurities and issues related to that. So the writing was on the wall. It was bound to happen at some point. And uh, even Adobe in 2015 had kind of posted and said, you know, there are more open solutions, open standards. It's time to make your move away from Flash. And uh, in, in essence, that was five years of warning. So that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I do wonder if Adobe's going to do something like open sourcing Flash mm -hmm. at that point. Since it's been around for so long, Adobe's already made its, made its money, you know, made a lot of its business off of it. You know, maybe they open sources so that it, pieces of the web uh, can be preserved uh, with it. But then at the same time, I could also see Adobe being like, how do we get as far away from Flash as possible and just put it to rest because it's time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? I, I need to make an addendum as long as we're talking about RIP products. Uh, the reports of Microsoft Paint, the, the reports of the death of Microsoft oh, Paint. Oh, yes. Gr greatly exaggerated mm -hmm. by us and others. <laughs> you can now, you can still buy Microsoft Paint, Microsoft says, on the Windows Store. It is free. You can still use it. Um, I'm assuming it, that it would still be updated as well. So um, there you see, they still love Microsoft Paint. Uh, so maybe we'll hear the same about Flash tomorrow, but I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. I think this is a little bit different, uh, but I'm happy to see this. Uh, MS Paint artists rejoice. Mm-hmm. So there is a playground skirmish going on between Tesla CEO Elon Musk and Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg about whether AI is going to kill us or not. For several, several years, Musk has been sounding alarms about the existential threat of artificial intelligence. You know, how robots will keep us as pets in the not so distant future, etc. Now, it wasn't until the billionaire spoke to the U.S. Governors Association that other big names in the tech industry began to very publicly disagree with him. First, the founder of iRobot said Musk didn't really understand AI, namely how dumb it was. Leo and I talked about this on the screensavers over the weekend. Uh, it really isn't as smart as everyone thinks it is. And then in a Facebook live stream, uh, Mark Zuckerberg answered a question about Elon's AI naysaying, calling him irresponsible. Sick burn, Zuck. <laughs> now Musk shot back saying Zuckerberg's knowledge of AI is, quote, limited. In other words, he was basically asking, like, do you even read scientific journals, bro? You, no, you suck. No, you suck. <laughs> no, you suck. Well, I mean, it is It is really, I think when, you, when we have arguments like this, or even when, like, public figures like that, who, let's just admit for a minute, they both know a lot about AI. A for lot sure. more than we do, a lot more than a lot of people. And both of their businesses rely on AI. And so it, it just kind of speaks to the, the sort of fear that we have uh, about artificial intelligence. And I think is totally healthy. Like, I, I think that Zuckerberg has and always has had this sort of rosy vision of the yeah. future. I mean, he says, yes, it's good to think about it. But I mean, for, for me, and uh, I, I line up with Elon Musk on, on this, that it is good to, what I always say is ex hope for the best and expect the worst. Mm. And that, that's what I feel. And when it comes, you know, when we're talking about a robot keeping me as a pet.
yeah, we'd like to be pleasantly surprised in the end and not yes. be like, yeah, I told you so. And I know we've uh, had, you and I have had these arguments too. Like I am a little bit more on the like, what is it, FUD or fear? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Yeah, yeah. FUD. yeah. I, I, I do lean towards FUD a little bit more than you do. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing I, I realized in, in reading through this is that Musk, Elon Musk, believes that we are living in a simu simulation and Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, wants to build that simulation. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so maybe that's indicative of their, their individual stances on this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think caution is important when, you know, you, you mentioned kind of in, in leading up this story that it's not as smart as we give it credit for that a and that's now, but we can see a lot of what it's capable of doing that was incredibly difficult to do before mm -hmm. and now seemingly done a whole lot easier. And then you scale that forward 10, 15 years and you can just imagine how it may not be as powerful as we think it is now, but you better believe it's going to continue to get more and more powerful and the potential of that um, is very real. So I think it's important and there are efforts happening right now where, uh, you know, data scientists, people who are really smart in the world of AI and neural networks and all that are putting their minds together and realizing, like, this could go horribly wrong if we don't respect it enough to pay attention to how it could go horribly wrong and maybe put some stop stop gaps in place so that that doesn't happen. I, I feel like you're right. Zuckerberg is super smart. I think it's kind of irresponsible for him to call it irresponsible to naysay or, or to point out the negatives of AI. I think you kind of have to if you're being responsible about it. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think uh, you know, Tim Urban, I think it's Tim Urban who does the But Wait But Why blog, which is amazing. Like he had a really good, he does all the drawings that are probably in Microsoft paint the not dead microsoft paint he did a really good explanation i i don't i don't think i put the link in here but i uh i i can add it to our show notes but just about how fast this all goes mm -hmm. i mean if someone were to have said you know 15 or 20 years ago gosh like smartphones are getting to be so amazing the potential of having like everyone just be constantly looking down at their phone and not talking to each other and someone was like oh that wouldn't happen i mean would we go back and say you're right like it's these games are fun and everything but like could we do something to stop that? I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but then again, you know, I, to that, I would just say, well, don't look at them as often. Burke said something funny about his chainsaw arm. Didn't uh, no, it has nothing <laughs> to do with the chainsaw arm. He says, AI will also be put into our brains if we are lucky. And we have a story coming up a little bit later, which I could see AI being a supplement to many of us that our companies just decide, hey, we can uh, supplement your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, it's opt-in, of course. Yes, Let of us course. in there, let us in there. Uh, Motorola announced its latest premium Android smartphone, the Moto Z2 Force, that accepts its catalog of Moto mods for expanding functionality. It's the modular uh, approach, all those little snap-on doohickeys. Uh, the Z2 Force has a shatterproof screen, as other Force phones in its catalog do. Uh, also, a dual rear-facing camera setup for those kind of uh, you know blurred-out background bokeh shots, and a Snapdragon 835 processor that competes with any of the current crop of top tier Android devices. Moto Z2 Force will release in the US on August 10th for $800. So this is definitely in the premium category for Motorola phones. 5.5 uh, inch uh, display, AMOLED display. Uh, it has a smaller battery from last year's Z1, 2730 milliamp hours, down from 3500 milliamp hours. But that makes it a little bit slimmer. So if you care about having a slim phone that you're then going to snap things on and make it a fat phone because of the Moto mods, here you go. Is it? But is it really a fat phone once you put the mods on? Well, I don't know. They, so they showed off there were the, one of the new Moto mods that they showed off is a 360 camera. It's a 4K camera Moto mod. They're selling it for 300 bucks. So that's an additional 300 dollars if you want this thing, which by the way, like only works with this phone versus other 300 dollar uh, 360 cameras <laughs> that work with all sorts of phones. So just keep that in mind. But when you snap that on, it's not just the camera. It's also this big case yeah. that has a battery as part of it. But it, I mean, from what I could tell online, it's, you know, it's one thing to have it in your hand versus online, but it, yeah, it made it look a little fat. <laughs> so, but there's also a projector Moto mod that right yeah, now, if you order, ones. if you order right now, you can get that free, the projector mod. I saw that somewhere. It's a $300 oh. value. Oh, so interesting. if you need okay. that. 
Um, so the ca- is is there regularly like a camera hump on the back? I, uh, there is. Well, you can see the cutout uh, on the case if okay, you show so the back. The I don't know if any of these show the back. Yeah. So if that. So so what you see there, the white and the camera on the very top protruding out, that's all part of the 360 camera. Uh, you take that white case off, and yeah, you get this little camera bump on the back, which okay. is hard to see on some of these. That That's the cutout for the camera bump. That's uh-huh. actually a different mode of mod. We're having Brian jump all around. Uh, there you go. There you go. So you have a little, well, a pretty decent sized camera bump on the back if you've got nothing else snapped onto the mm-hmm. pogo pins. Got so, it. you know, it ends up being a slim phone. Um, Ron Amadio from Ars Technica did kind of a hands-on and made a really good point, which is that Motorola in its in its quest to make mod- its modular catalog, the Moto Mods, successful, made a guarantee that they would develop out for the next three years based on these things and that they would be compatible, which essentially means that the design of these pr- these Motorola phones isn't going to change very much, if at all, over the next three years. So what you get is what you get. So, you know, in comparison with a lot of design choices that are being made now with like bezel design and, you know, all these other things, Motorola is kind of locked into this for the next few years for a bet around modular that I'm not sure a whole lot of people are buying into. So I know a lot of people in your circle are either, you know, Pixel fans or they just try whatever phone, you know, they're they're Android people who have to try all the phones. But do you know anyone who's like, Moto all the way, that's all I'll use? No. No. (laughs) Not really. Nobody. (laughs) Not really. Do you? Burke knows someone. Russell. Oh, so he's, oh, so Russell, our engineer, our house engineer here, and uh, he works on a lot of the tech in the back end. He's, uh, he, yeah, he does have a, a yeah, he's and had a few Moto phones. pictures so. that he takes that he posts on Instagram, are they all from a Moto? Because he takes some good photos. I can't remember. He may, he may have, and I might be wrong, but he may have the, I think it was a Carl Zeiss, was it? Moto Mod? Maybe it wasn't Zeiss. It was a, uh, man, a hammer, hammer. Suddenly I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but. It was it was a it was a it was a moto mod that you snap onto the back that basically turns the phone into a full camera with a zoom, and uh, so he might have that. I would know if he had that. Burke would know if he had that, and Burke does not know that he does have that. So okay. I could so be wrong. I think Scooter X says he Probably loves not. moto phones. Hasselblad. That's oh, what I was looking for. Hasselblad. Uh, uh, so that's your regular phone, Scooter X. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know what? Motorola has in the past had some really great years of Android phones. When they were owned by Google, Motorola was mm-hmm. the bee's knees, you know, for, for a few years there. Uh, and then since then, it, they've kind of been, you know, under Lenovo, they're kind of, I think, reproving themselves to the Android faithful, let's say. And I, I think the Moto Mod bet has been interesting because you love to see, I love to see a company trying new things and not being afraid to try new things. I just don't know how much of a success it's actually been. So there you go. Well, after the break, the House Energy and Commerce Committee has invited tech CEOs to testify to Congress about net neutrality, but will it change anything and will they show up? But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage, the sponsor of this episode. The mortgage experience, if you've ever been through it, you know it was not keeping up with the times. It was pretty dated. What it needed was a client-focused technological revolution. And that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. You can fully understand all the details and be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. So you know there's tons of details, so much paperwork, a lot of confusing jargon that you can try to understand, but it would be easy if someone made it easy and Rocket Mortgage has. It's convenient. They have trusted partners that you can just share your financial information uh, with them through just a touch of a button on whatever device you're using. And it's also powerful. So you might be looking to buy your first home, you might be refinancing a home, Uh, You might be buying your 10th home. Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in just a few seconds. So it looks at your income, all your assets, your credit, and then it can analyze all of your home loan options, all the ones that you qualify for, and then find the right one that's right just for you. So maybe you want to use a mortgage broker. Maybe you want to spend time in someone's office waiting, making an appointment, getting bad coffee. Maybe you want to make things a lot easier with Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply 
understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, all you have to do is go to rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. That's rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. Don't forget to add the TNT after that. That's how they know that you found out about them through Tech News Today, TNT. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. Congress wants the CEOs of Facebook, Google, AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, and others to testify at a net neutrality hearing on September 7th. The so-called ground rules for the internet ecosystem will focus on potential legislation that will shape the future of the internet and potentially affect the bottom line of the companies testifying. Recode Senior Policy and Politics Editor Tony Rahm is here to talk about what does the news of this hearing mean? Yeah, this hearing is going to be a big question mark for much of the tech industry. Uh, you know, at the moment, the House Energy and Commerce Committee, led by a Republican lawmaker Greg Walden, has asked the leading executives of Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Netflix to come testify in September. The hearing is scheduled for September 7th. But you know, the committee can't force those executives to come testify. It can ask them very politely. It can yell at them if they ultimately don't show up, but it's ultimately up to the companies to decide. And so that's going to be the real test here, whether these major tech companies, which talk about neutrality but have other interests in mind, are willing to send their top executives to Washington to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the telecom industry. The likes of AT&T and Verizon have also been invited to this hearing. So we could see a showdown in September or this could just be a bit of nothing if nobody sends anybody of note. So what's, uh, have you heard, do you think that these CEOs will show up? You know, it's early. We only got word of the hearing uh, this morning and I've talked to all of the companies and not a single one of them, tech or telecom, has said anything about their attendance. I also talked to the committee. The committee said the same thing. It hasn't heard anything either. And they really have until July 31st to correspond with congressional Republicans about their plans. But in the conversations I've had with lawmakers, the big takeaway is that they really want CEOs. They don't want lobbyists and lawyers to show up to this hearing. Whether that happens is another question entirely, but for the moment, I can't tell you a single one who's going because no one has told me if they're going. And they have, don't they have until, or supposedly they have until like the end of this month to to confirm. Yeah. So I guess that means we're probably going to find out in the next few days or begin uh, to start. Yeah, hearing. we have. Yeah, yeah, we have we have we have matter days as to whether they attend. And you know, in, in many cases with hearings like this, you know, it's a negotiation. It'll come down to uh, much closer uh, to September, regardless of what the letter to chief executives, uh, tech or telecom, may have said. You know, they'll, they'll they'll probably work this out well past July 31st. But they're supposed to tell the committee by then uh, who they're sending. But you know, I think at the end of the day. Uh, from the tech company perspective, it might look really bad if they don't send their executives. I mean, the likes of Facebook and Google have talked for so long about the importance of net neutrality. And, you know, when push comes to shove, when they're finally asked to confront this issue on Capitol Hill, if they don't send somebody of importance, it potentially conveys this message that maybe net neutrality isn't the big political or policy issue uh, that matters to those companies in 2017. Well, a lot of these companies participated in the big day, the big awareness day a few weeks ago around net neutrality. You had expected that they would want to be involved uh, to this in, to some degree. And we've heard a lot about like, obviously, we've got both sides of the matter, uh, both for and against who will be attending and other companies that represent those sides are going to be attending, uh, supposedly. And we know a lot of, of the ways that they differ. Um, are there any ways that they come to this this meeting and they kind of have some sort of common ground on arriving uh, at, at this event? Will there be any common ground, do you think? Sure. Well, the a primary common ground is that everybody wants Congress to issue a final solution on net neutrality. This issue has ping-ponged back and forth between federal courts and the FCC for about 15 years, uh, and there really hasn't been much of a resolution in sight. And there's a broad belief, whether you're an AT&T or you're a Facebook, that you know the party control of the White House and the FCC can't be what dictates uh, how we approach net neutrality. This issue of net neutrality was settled, really, uh, until 
until Republicans won the White House and President Donald Trump tapped a Republican to run the FCC. If that hadn't happened, these rules might actually be fine. They might stay on the books and uh, we wouldn't be having the conversation that we're having right now. So there's a belief that Congress should probably do something, take this out of the realm of politics, set down a more lasting solution on net neutrality, and then we won't keep having to talk about this all the time. Mm -hmm. But when we get into the specifics as to what net neutrality looks like, that's a different debate. Everyone believes that there shouldn't be blocking or throttling. Those are the very basic tenets of net neutrality. But when you get into the real nitty gritty, things like paid prioritization or online fast lanes, uh, depending on where you sit in the debate, that's where Republicans and Democrats and telecom and tech differ. There appears to be more uh, of a desire on the part of telecom companies and their Republican allies to allow this sort of paid prioritization as long as it's not harmful to companies. So to give you an example, you know, you, you don't, we don't want to charge Netflix, for instance, uh, for faster delivery of its movies or its TV shows to consumers. But if there's a way to charge a self-driving car company uh, for faster access to a company's pipes, to an internet provider's pipes, then maybe they would necessarily do that. That's actually an issue raised by Comcast in its filings with the FCC that paid prioritization might benefit autonomous vehicles and so forth. I know it sounds really nerdy, but these are the breakdowns of this debate, like how you actually translate the principles that we're talking about into law. And when it comes to that, we're very far away from any sort of compromise. So you had a great interview on Recode Decode, uh, the podcast, talking to Democratic Senator Cory Booker. And one of the things that he said was that uh, it, coming up with rules while we have a Republican Congress and a Republican president will end up with weaker rules uh, in general. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, Senator Booker's point was that as a Democrat who believes very strongly in the rules put in place by former President Barack Obama, uh, it, it's kind of hard to negotiate with Republicans who don't like the rules put in place by former President Barack Obama. Uh, there are really two ways to look at that. On one hand, what Senator Booker is saying is that it, it's hard for Democrats to compromise knowing that President Trump probably would veto anything that looked uh, like the rules that are currently on the, on the government's books. And we should probably hit the pause button for a second and talk about those rules. They treat internet providers like an AT&T or a Comcast, uh, much like old school telecom, telephone companies. It's utility-like regulation in order to uh, enforce net neutrality. Telecom companies don't like it. Republicans don't like it. Uh, Democrats want that in place. Uh, and, and, and so Booker's point is that they aren't going to get that because even if they got close to it, Trump would veto it. But I think the thing that was missing in the conversation that we had was a recognition that the FCC already can trash these rules. They already have the votes at the FCC to eliminate the net neutrality rules that are currently on the government's books. So I, I don't know what Democrats are going to hold out for. It, it's going to happen whether they like it or not, whether they get that sort of legislation uh, that, that that kind of finds a compromise in this issue is going to depend on whether Democrats and Republicans can sit in a room and actually hammer out their differences. But as we've seen in a number of contexts in the past couple months, whether it's technology or healthcare or what have you, that isn't a thing that's happening. So uh, we're a far, far away away from like having any sort of net neutrality legislation uh, that can get anywhere close to the president's desk. Hmm, okay, well, that kind of shoots down my question. But what I was what I was kind of thinking <laughs> leading up to here is that, you know, we've been, like you said, it's been a kind of a, a tennis match, you know, bouncing back and forth, back and forth, keeps coming up, keeps changing. Now we're kind of at the point to where we are going, this is going to move in, in front of a congressional hearing. And I'm, I'm just, I guess what I'm wondering is, Based on kind of where it's transitioning right now with Ajit Pai, you know, seeking to basically repeal and, and move it out of the FCC's hands uh, for the time being, net neutrality proponents may have been happy with the way it was, let's say. Uh, do you think there's the possibility that they're going to be even happier with the way with the changes that could come from the result of this? Or is this going to be a big kind of give and take on both sides? Everybody's going to be kind of mildly amused with well, what they get. Well, there's, there's, there's no give and take at the FCC. 
uh, Chairman Pai is going to delete the rules that are currently on the government's books with respect to net neutrality. Right. Those are the utility-like regulations that Democrats and lots of liberal groups uh, and lots of tech companies currently support. And what he puts uh, in their place is uh, the subject of debate right now at the FCC. But there is a world in which Chairman Pai could choose not to put anything in their place at all. That was one of the things that he asked uh, tech and telecom companies and others who were weighing into the agency to address in the comments that were due to the FCC about a week or so ago. He asked them if the FCC should have any rules on its books. So there's a world in which the FCC doesn't do anything at all. There's also nothing that forces Congress to touch net neutrality. If it washed its hands and walked away from this debate, that would be perfectly within Congress's remit. There's nothing that forces them to the table here. And anything short of the Obama administration's rules, the very things that are about to be repealed, uh, are probably not going to be enough for a lot of net neutrality advocates. They really believe that the only way you can stop companies from charging for faster delivery of web content, the only way you can stop a Comcast or an AT&T from, from, from charging web, uh, web companies for faster delivery of that content is through the rules that are currently of, on the government's books. Anything else is too weak and it's not going to work. So, you know, we're at a big fundamental divide here and and whether we can you know cross that and find some sort of compromise is is, is a very tough question that uh, has eluded lawmakers for many, many years. I've covered this debate for a very long time. And remember the last time, the last three times that Congress said it was going to deal with something on net neutrality and not a single one of them resulted in legislation that got anywhere. And there's nothing that suggests to me that this time is really that much different. The, the only difference probably is that Congress does even less now <laughs> because of all the partisan differences between Democrats and Republicans. Right. We had Elliot Harmon from the EFF on a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him this question, and I'm going to ask you too. Uh, and obviously today, uh, health care is the big news in D.C. and the possibility of many people leaving, uh, losing their health care. Uh, what do you say to people who say, like, why do I need to care about net neutrality when I might not be able to get my prescription medicine? It, this is the huge challenge that a lot of folks face in this debate. How, like, how, how do you talk about it when we're talking about health care? And, and uh, I don't think anybody who, who cares about both of those issues is going to tell you that net neutrality is more important than health care reform or that it's more important than uh, tax or infrastructure reforms, which are the next two things uh, on President Trump's agenda. Whether he can get them done or not, it's another matter, but it's certainly uh, what's on its agenda. But uh, the, the question with net neutrality is – how you access things online, uh, the amount that you may or may not have to pay to access those things online, uh, and, and when you really drill down to it, uh, the competition for online services and between internet providers. These are things that matter on a very, very discreet day-to-day -day basis. The, the way that we log on to Skype to have this conversation, the amount that we pay Comcast or AT&T for access to our uh, broadband service, whether it's on our laptops or it's on our smartphones. Uh, they're, they're, they're very tiny things, but they're very important things. Uh, but, but, uh, but I wouldn't put them anywhere close to healthcare. I, I certainly wouldn't. Uh, and and I do think the challenge in having this debate is is breaking through all that noise. Uh, you know, if you compare the protests that we had just a few days ago, you know, where many tech companies, as you guys pointed out, uh, joined an online rally in support of net neutrality to. Uh, some of the previous efforts uh, with respect to protests, uh, whether it was net neutrality or the Stop Online Piracy Act, SOPA, uh, where the internet blacked out in opposition to that legislation. There's a big difference between those two. I just feel like people probably didn't notice this most recent go around, this most recent protest, because there was so much else happening on Twitter, on Facebook, elsewhere, uh, that, that was really dominating the political conversation. Things like healthcare that just have much higher stakes for most people in their day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. Well, Tony, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk to us. Tony Rom is the senior editor for Policy and Politics at Recode. He's Tony Rom on Twitter. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Take thank care. you, Tony. It was a pleasure. Have a good night. All right. Uh, where do you go to debunk a story that's about Snopes? You normally go to Snow, but you can't go there for this. We'll talk about that. Uh, but first, let's take a minute to thank ZipRecruiter. They're the sponsor of this episode. If you're in charge of hiring, you know, you already know that you have the most important job in the company. The people that you hire can make or break your business. 
Uh, but do you even know where to post jobs to find the most qualified candidates? It's it's challenging. The internet is a really big place, and there are people posting uh, their resumes all over the place, and you've got to find those because in each of those little corners around the internet are qualified candidates. ZipRecruiter will connect you to the most qualified candidates for any job, including highly sought-after tech professionals. With just one click, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites. Their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you, it finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. No more juggling emails or calls uh, to your office. You simply screen, you rate, and manage the candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. They make it super easy. You can connect with a wide variety of professionals, including IT experts, and take your company to the next level today. More than 200 million applications have been delivered, and if you're currently searching for a job, by the way, ZipRecruiter will help find your future job in any industry, including technology, government, business, finance, and more. You just upload your resume and apply with a single click. Be sure to check out the ZipRecruiter blog for recruiting tips and career advice. All that's important information that can help you out. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. You just go to ZipRecruiter dot com slash twit that's ziprecruiter.com slash twit check it out for yourself for free and we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of tech news today uh gabriel actually sent us this article in the feedback section here he says hey guys check this out straight out of black mirror and i completely agree it was what i thought when i read about this this story here three square market in wisconsin uh is i think they employ somewhere around well, they have around 20, 25 employees uh, that they're offering chips to the employees, not to eat, but to <laughs> insert into their skin RFID technology in a chip the size of a grain of rice that they are allowing their, their employees to opt into, but they can insert this into their skin in a place that it doesn't interfere and, and you know it isn't going to hurt them or whatever, but that allows them and will allow them in the future to gain access to the facility, to actually enable them to purchase food while they're there. I just, I don't know how I feel about this. I like the more and more I don't, I don't want technology inside my skin. It creeps me out. I don't want technology inside my skin either. And I think that the <laughs> funny words in this, in the, the story that you, the way you just described that is they're allowing people yes. and they're offering it and it's opt-in. So allow, offer, opt-in. Okay. Uh -huh. I got it all there. This is people willingly doing this. Yeah. So Sure. Go ahead uh, and willingly put this tech, this tracking technology in your skin if it helps you get uh, into the chips building faster. really fast. <laughs> into the building, <laughs> yes. Or, but at the same time, I mean, is it you know, as Black Mirror enthusiasts, we would say like, is it that far from the fact that we're carrying you know a, f a phone around with us everywhere it go? The watch is attached to me. It's they're allowing me to, you know, to be tracked constantly. Is it that different? Because yeah, it's fashionable? Yeah. Because it also gives me the time? Yeah, That's yeah. true. It's probably not that much different. Although you, you take it to another level when you allow a company to insert technology underneath your skin. Like, you you know what I mean? It's, it's a next step to actually allow someone to cut into you and put something inside of you. Um, but, but the end result is basically the same. You're absolutely right. Um, depending on how deep, you know, they would go with this RFID tracking technology, whatever, mm -hmm. maybe now it's just gaining access to a building. Uh, maybe at some point they, you know, companies like this expand the functionality to, GPS track or whatever the case may be. And you could see where it would kind of go even further down the black mirror hole, rabbit I, hole. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that what's, uh, what's upsetting to people, what's, you know, disconcerting to people is that it came from the company. Yeah. Like, and I think we hear that the same way when we hear about companies saying like, we'll all, we'll give you all an Apple watch. If you, um, you know, compete, if you are healthy or whatever, you know, yeah. enough, if you could do your steps or we'll give you. And uh -huh. so then you're like, Oh, like you're, you're, you're really tracking me. 
Uh, but you know, there's no, I don't have a twit app on this. There's no, there's nothing about the company that, that, that is tracking me. It's just not the company that I work for, but giant companies like, you know, Apple or Google or whatever apps I have on here. Mm -hmm. And I, so yeah, <laughs> I, but I, I, I do, I'm not into the whole biohacking thing at all. I mean, there are people that like to have like magnets inside their skin in order to open beer bottles. And that's just not my jam, but mm -hmm. I don't judge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, hey, to, uh, to each their own. Addie Robertson, actually from The Verge. She's uh, pretty notable, you know, on the on the Verge side. If you read some of her articles, she has a decent amount of stuff around biohacking and everything. Because I believe she actually has a chip uh, embedded. And she actually just wrote an article on the twenty first of July that says, "I hacked my body for a future that never came." Mm. So, you know, maybe it's still early. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, it definitely. Um, yeah. Uh, Burke Burke makes a very uh, prescient point. He says chainsaw arm uh, would get Burke into a building very quick. That's true. Well, what if uh, Leo and Lisa allowed you that chainsaw arm, allowed they, you, yes, offered you, you the chainsaw in. arm, and you'd opt in, <laughs> and then it also would track you wherever you went. He's like, I don't care. Chainsaw arm. That's all I care about. Okay. We should know this by now. That's all Burke cares about is chainsaw arm. That's the thing that he would willingly turn over his privacy. <laughs> yes. Perhaps. For the convenience of a yes. chainsaw as an arm. Because, I mean, you could fight against anyone who is going to do anything nefarious to you with the chainsaw arm. Yeah, no one's, no one's coming at you. I have one more question about the chainsaw arm. Is <laughs> it in replace of one of, is it in the place of one of your arms or would it be like a third appendage? Yes. Yes. <laughs> this is his answer. His answer is yes. Okay. okay. Right, now we know. All right. TNT's fan of the day is John Hullinger on Twitter who sent us this pic saying, watching TNT with my son before work. Um, this uh, is yeah. awesome. So John uh, has uh, emailed me. He's a truck driver and he has spent a lot of his own personal time explaining to me the logistics of uh, driving a truck, uh, what it's like to contract for companies like Amazon and FedEx and just a lot of the things that we talk about. Um, I've asked him about because I don't, I mean, I think it's something that everyone should learn more about how our stuff gets to us. Yeah. The, the double clutch. He wasn't the one that told me about the double clutch. He was more of logistics. <laughs> so I he thank John because, I mean, it is amazing how yeah. much we rely on trucks and truckers to get our things Absolutely. to us. And it is not an easy job. It. it is a difficult job. If you've ever taken a road trip, you know, there's like no healthy food out there. You are up for hours and hours. So thank you, John yeah. and all the rest of you truckers out there. And thank you for sending us pictures. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT, record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup, post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter or Facebook. Use the hashtag how I watch TNT and we will find it. All right. You may have seen that Snopes, which is a site that many pull up to debunk and validate rumors online, is having some tough times. They're hosting a GoFundMe to stay afloat. In fact, it's the kind of story you might turn to Snopes to debunk. But <laughs> in this case, it's actually true. Snopes is involved in a legal battle, apparently, that has cut the site off from revenue in the process that's pushing the founders to uh, the founder to publish a letter asking for financial assistance from its readers uh, to pay its staff, keep the lights on. I guess they have uh, they have 16 full time employees, no ad revenue since February 2017 because they're living off they're living off a surplus during this very complicated kind of legal um, legal issue that involved the the two founders, a man and wife. They they got divorced. She ended up selling her share to another company and now you know it's, it's very complicated but basically now they're kind of struggling to maintain full ownership on either side and in the meantime they aren't making any money off of it so apparently in one single day uh they went to uh, gofundme and readers twenty thousand people who visit the site uh donated five hundred thousand dollars which is going to keep things going for at least a few months of operations. And I don't know if that'll continue, but I, I feel like we've talked about Snopes a decent amount in the course of the last year because it goes hand in hand a lot of times with what uh, a lot of the social networks like Facebook uh, and others are doing to uh, kind of put some visibility around, you know, clarifying whether news is fake or real, is it debunked, whatever. And Snopes ends up being one of those major sources that they turn to because it's all kind of community driven and uh, just a really good place to go when you don't know whether what you're reading is actually true or not. I know. I went to Snopes to make sure this uh, implanted 
Chip story was true. And they said it was true. But yeah, it is. Um, yeah, GoFundMe.com slash Save Snopes because yeah, they've kind of laid out exactly what they need to keep yeah. going um, with if they don't settle this disagreement. So yeah, if you love Snopes and you feel compelled to donate to them, then that's, that's where you go. I guess now they're at 584,000, says Bleak in the chat room. So it keeps going up. $584,892. Nice. They passed their goal. I'm sure they could use it. Uh, but I really hope Snopes sticks around. It's it's one of those sites that you kind of take for granted because it's been around for so long. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many times like something would be passed around on Facebook by like relatives or whatever and be mm -hmm. like, all right, hey, take a look at this link and you know, yeah. send them the Snopes link associated with it. And you probably never hear back. <laughs> I never hear back after I do that. So I'm like, wait a minute, do they read it or do they think I'm a jerk or what just happened there? I, yeah. I thought I was doing you a favor. No one thinks you're a jerk, Jason. It, yeah, but if you've ever felt smug by Snow, if Snopes had ever, has ever helped you win an argument with someone, made you feel <laughs> smug, um, any, uh, I, I don't know, maybe you want to bet, maybe you want to consider giving those proceeds from that bet that you got from Snopes to the GoFundMe campaign. Yeah, or maybe you spread misinformation and you know you've made it when it hits Snopes, right? That's that's like the level of achievement. <clears throat> don't uh, do that. Don't do that. Please. But unless it's really funny and obvious. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. Uh, you can always be part of the show by emailing us, tnt at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW and find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. Hey, subscribe to our hey. show. Go to twit.tv slash TNT. I don't know if you know this, but Jason uh -huh. does another show and I do another show. So go and subscribe to those too, twit.tv. Uh, if you want to learn all about Android, you can subscribe to that. If you want to learn all about iOS, you can subscribe to that. There's so many shows that, that are they're done on the network. So go subscribe. And if you want to tweet at me to tell me where I can go if Snopes disappears, I need to know. I'm yeah. at Megan Maroney. And let me know, too, at Jason Howell. I really do need to know. Uh, thanks to our technical director, Brian Burnett. Thank you for pushing buttons back there. Thanks to Burke for helping out in the studio and occasional chainsaw arms. Uh, thanks to Kevin for editing the show, I think, today. Uh, we love you, Kevin. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Don't forget. I forgot. Bye. <laughs>